If you have been interested in fractals before, you have probably encountered the subject of this video, the Cantor set. The Cantor set is a very famous one-dimensional fractal that can be used to generate some other well-known fractals in two dimensions. But before that, let's examine the Cantor set a little more. Since the Cantor set is closely related to 3 and thirds, it has a strong relationship with base 3. Let's start with a quick review on number bases. The number base we are most familiar with is base 10. When working with different bases, people often notate the base being used with a little subscript, like this. A number with multiple digits is usually written as shown on screen. But let me introduce my favorite tool in math, expanded form. Let's use the number on screen as an example. 178 can also be written as 1 times 100 plus 7 times 10 plus 8, or like this. 1 times 10 squared plus 7 times 10 to the first plus 8 times 10 to the zero where the base is written with decreasing integer powers. When one of the numbers grows past 9, it is replaced with a 0 and we increment the place value to the left. In base 10, this is due to there being 10 symbols to represent digits. When we go past the value of the highest digit, we need to use place value instead. In base 3, there are 3 symbols, 0 through 2. When we write in expanded form, the 10s will be replaced by 3s. We cannot describe numbers as 178 in base 3 because 7 and 8 are too large. We can only use 0, 1, and 2. For example, the number 120 in base 3 would be 1 times 3 squared plus 2 times 3 to the first plus 0 times 3 to the 0, or 15 in base 10. 178 would be 20121 in base 3, which you can check with the expanded form below. Most of the numbers we will be working with are fractions, and they will go past the decimal point to the right. For example, 0.21 in base 10 would be 2 times 10 to the negative 1, plus 1 times 10 to the negative 2 in expanded form, which is 21 over 100. And in base 3, 0.21 in expanded form would be 2 times 3 to the negative 1, plus 1 times 3 to the negative 2, which is 7 over 9 in base 10. The process for finding the decimal representation of a fraction is very similar. You would use long division. Let's look at 1 over 6, or in base 3, 1 over 2, 0 as an example. As with normal long division, you put the 2, 0 on the outside, and the 1.0000 on the inside. I suggest pausing to try base 3 division first, and come back to check if your answer matches mine. When you carry out the process, you should find the fraction 1 over 2, 0 in base 3 becomes 0 0.01111, with 1s repeating infinitely. In some cases, we will also be working with binary, or base 2. For binary, the possible symbols are 0 and 1 only, and instead of 10 or 3, we use 2 for the base in expanded form. I will put two examples we used for base 3 back on screen, and try to pause to see how they will be written in binary. I will put the binary version on screen right now, and you can check to see if your answers match mine. I will also provide some resources in the description if you would still like some more review on number bases. Now that we have finished reviewing number bases, let's move to the star of the show, the Cantor set. To construct the Cantor set, more specifically the middle thirds Cantor set, you start with a line segment of length 1. It is then sliced into three thirds and the middle third is removed. We are then left with two pieces. Each of the two pieces are then cut into three thirds each and the middle third of each is removed. Now there are four pieces and the middle third of each of them are removed. We continue this process over and over to infinity. One thing most people look at when they first see the Cantor set is to check its total length. First, we start by denoting the length of the first iteration of the Cantor set, the line segment, to be L0. L0 has a length of 1. The length of the next iteration can be defined as L1, and since you remove the middle third, you get 2 thirds. If we continue this to get L2, since we are removing the middle ninth of each segment, we get 2 thirds minus 2 ninths equals 4 ninths. If you notice, we always remove a third of the remaining length. Or in other words, the total length becomes two-thirds of the length of the previous iteration. Recursively, ln equals two-thirds ln minus one. Explicitly, 
ln equals 2 thirds to the power of n. If we take the limit as n approaches infinity, then L would approach 0. Let's look at the first iteration of the Cantor set. If we represent each location on the line segment in base 3, the first third starts with a 0, the second third starts with a 1, and the third third starts with a 2. The number 1 represents the middle third, so we can tell when a number is cut when the first 1 appears. It seems like if a 1 appears in the nth position after a decimal point, it'll be cut in the nth cut. If a 1 does not appear, then that means it will not be cut. However, it's not that simple. Let's look at some examples. The number 1 half can be represented as 0.111, with 1 repeating forever. The first 1 appears one place after the decimal point, so it will be cut in the first cut. Another example would be 1 sixth. As we saw earlier, in base 3, it is written as 0 0.01, with 1s repeating forever after that. The first 1 appears in the second place after the decimal point, which means it will be cut in the second cut. It's very easy to see that there will be an infinite amount of these points that will get cut. After all, the line segment should have a total length of 0 when we cut it an infinite amount of times. The number 1 third is interesting. The interval cut could be the open interval 1 third to 2 thirds, in which case 1 third is not cut out in the first cut, or even at all. Instead, if the interval cut is the closed interval 1 third to 2 thirds, 1 third is cut out in the first cut. Which one do you think it is? You could argue for either case, but it's more interesting to consult base 3. Clearly, 1 third equals 0 0.1 with zeros repeating afterwards. So that means 1 third would be cut in the first cut. However, 2 thirds equals 0 0.2 with zeros repeating afterwards. So that means it'll never be cut. So that means the interval of cutting would be closed on the left and open on the right? Depending on which side of the argument you're on, you would find this conclusion absurd. But also, depending on what side of 1 third you're on, you would also find a different answer. Let's create a function that describes the behavior of the first cut. It'll be 0 where we know it'll not be cut, and 1 where we know it will be cut. Still, we have no idea how to deal with 1 third, but we can see that the limits of the function from the left and the right are different. If we look at it numerically, 1 third in base 3 can not only be represented as 0 0.1 with zeros repeating forever, which would match the limit approaching from the right, but it can also be represented as 0 0.02 with 2s repeating forever, matching the limit approaching from the left. So in a way, one third is ambiguous. Depending on your choice of context, it is either cut first or never cut. Two thirds can also be represented very similarly as 0 0.12 with twos repeating. So two thirds is also ambiguous. In fact, all numbers that end with a one followed by infinite zeros are on the left side of a cut, and all numbers that end with a one followed by infinite twos are on the right side of a cut. Let's do one more example. We have one half and one third, so let's do one fourth. One fourth can be represented in base three as 0 0.0202, with the zero two repeating. There are no ones, but it's not like one third, where it ends with a one with infinite zeros or infinite twos. In fact, if we zoom in, it seems like it's avoiding being cut by a large margin every time. Weirdly, the Cantor set has zero total length, but it has fractions which are still in the set. These fractions will never be cut, but the fractions around them will. They have zero thickness. There are an infinite amount of these, and there is an easy way to construct them. For those familiar with repeating decimals, 1 fourth is represented as 0 0.02 repeating, which is the same as 2 over 9 minus 1. Another example of a repeating decimal is 0 0.002 repeating, which can be represented as 2 over 27 minus 1, or 1 thirteenth. They don't necessarily have to repeat the whole decimal, like 0 0.0202 with the 202 repeating. This can be represented as 20 over 3 times 27 minus 1, or 20 over 78, which equals 10 over 39. Here are some more examples. We have determined that locations on the Cantor set fall into three categories, cut at an nth cut, never cut, or ambiguous. Any number from 0 to 1 will land in one of these three categories, 
and you now know the way to determine which one it lands in. I feel a little bad for removing the pieces entirely, so instead, let's put the cut pieces into this conveniently shaped box. Let's keep the pieces in their relative positions, but we can move them up or down. For the largest piece, it would make the most sense to put it in the middle row of the box. Following its fractal nature, let's put the next two pieces in the middle row of each half, like this. Then we add the next set in the middle of each quarter in increasing order, and so on. If we label where each set of the cuts land in binary, the nth set of cuts will have a 1 in the nth place after the decimal point, and the locations land in all possible combinations of zeros and ones for the digits in between the decimal point and the last one. That was really hard to explain in words, so let's use an example. The locations of the segment from the third cut land in 0 .001, 0 .011, 0 .101, and 0 .111. As you can see, there is always a 1 in the third place after the decimal point, and the four unique ways to make two decimal digits are in between the final one and the decimal point. If we continue this process, we get this weird curve. This curve actually has a name, the Devil's Staircase. I will leave more resources in the description, but the most interesting thing about this function is that it has a derivative, or slope when you zoom in far enough, of 0 everywhere, but still manages to increase from 0 to 1. Let's try creating some different Cantor sets. What if I refuse to cut the middle third of the original line segment, then we repeat the process on each third that we did before? Before we continue, let's define what a cut actually means. A cut means, for the nth step, we cut the middle 1 over 3 to the n out of each 1 over 3 to the n minus 1. In every step, we can either choose to cut or not cut. Similar to picking locations on the Cantor set, I will define a 1 as a choice to cut and a 0 or a 2 as a choice to not cut. Each cutting sequence can be described as a sequence of inputs from left to right. For example, 1 1 with zeros repeating infinitely is the second iteration of the Cantor set. For the sake of brevity, Let's just consider examples with three digits, like 0, 2, 1, which is no cut, no cut, cut. For reasons that will become clearer soon, I'm going to add a decimal point on the left and make this rectangle's height exactly 1 27th of its width. If we stack all 27 of the three-digit constructions in ascending order from point 0, 0, 0 to point 0.000 to 0.222, we get the 1 by 1 Manger sponge. The Menger sponge is a fractal that has a very similar construction to the middle thirds Cantor set. You start with a square, you cut it into nine smaller squares, and you take out the middle ninth. You are then left with eight mini squares. Then for each of the eight mini squares, you repeat the same process. This process is continued over and over to infinity. If we look at the third iteration of Menger's sponge, and the stack that we created, they are identical. This will work for any nth iteration of the Menger sponge, and a stack of all n-digit constructions of Cantor sets. Let's try changing the rules so 0 and 2 don't have the same rule. Let's keep the rule for 0 and 1 the same, and instead, let's have 2 remove 2 thirds of the segment, by removing one third on each side. Also, instead of a one removing a middle third, let's shift it equally out to one sixth on each side. Similar to the Menger sponge, each cutting sequence can be described as a sequence of digits after the decimal place, read from left to right. And a cut is defined so that for the nth step, we cut the required d over three to the n out of each one over three to the n minus one where d is the digit in the nth place after the decimal point. If the prior step was a 1, the remaining two-thirds of the segment is cut in half. For example, 0, 1, 2 is no cut, cut one-sixth on each side, then cut one-third on each side. Then, if we stack the construction for point 0, 0, 0 to point 0.222 this time, 
we get the Sierpinski Triangle. Wait, no, um, it looks like the Sierpinski Triangle, but it's like a three-layered version instead. Okay, let's try this. Since the Sierpinski Triangle has two layers, perhaps binary is better. This means a zero is no cut, and for a one, we remove one-fourth on each side. Then let's pick all four-digit sequences and make the rectangle's height one-sixteenth of its width. If we stack the 16 layers, there we go. We've got the Sierpinski triangle we know and love. If we instead picked a different stack for Cantor sets using base B, we would get a B-layered Sierpinski triangle. I leave it up to you to figure out the rules to construct Cantor sets for a different base. You have now seen three different connections from the Cantor set to two-dimensional fractals, and I encourage you to continue exploring and see if you can find any more connections or even bring in the third dimension. Thank you for listening to me, counting to three, and I hope to see you in another video.